So, yeah, I, I want to um, also uh, thank Colonel Wolf for joining us tonight. Uh, it was very gracious for him to drop in and, and help us answer questions. And uh, thank you, Bill, for, for joining us. I appreciate it very much. Yes, sir. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So I'll start off by saying that uh, none of the material you are going to see in this presentation is sensitive or classified. Everything comes off of the, the Internet um, that I got. Uh, there are two primary sources of material. One was the uh, report to congressional committees from the Department of the Air Force, comprehensive plan for the organizational structure of the U.S. Space Force that was um, that was published in February. And then there was the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act. Um, some of the secondary source materials, magazines, the Air Force Mag magazine, uh, Space News, and some of the, some government websites. So everything you're you're about to see, you can get online yourselves. So, like um, General David Thompson, who's the Vice Commander of U.S. Space Force, uh, recently said, uh, it's like 1947 for the United States Space Force. There's a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm and adrenaline. And, and I can see it um, everywhere I, I look. There's there's a lot of excitement about standing up a brand new uh, um, military force. Um, everyone who's doing it is a pioneer. And uh, gosh, how many times do we get a chance to pioneer anything in life? It's a very exciting time. Um, unfortunately, I had some videos that won't play. Um, so I'll just try to hit what what uh, I wanted to to hit on here was uh, General Hyten, who's the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, what he was saying in a video to Congress um, as to why we want to stand up a separate uh, branch of the military. And that's uh, He was saying, and this really just jumped out at me, space at best will never be his higher uh, than third priority. Um, you know, this is the Joint Chiefs of the Staff saying this. So it, it sort of spoke to um, the fact that the space, um, uh, the Air Force Space Command was kind of buried down into the, the structure of the Air Force so that the president wasn't hearing directly from the commander of the Space Forces. Another thing that he said, we need a military structure inside the Pentagon that's focused on space all of the time. So it, he said it as succinctly as possibly uh, that, um, you know, there is a need for a separate branch of the military. <clears throat> so, I was talking to a cadet uh, two or three months ago. We happened to bring up Space Force in, in conversation, and she kind of chuckled and said, you know, is, is that a real thing? And uh, here we see it, it most definitely is a real thing. Um, it, the president signed it, uh, or codified it into law with his signature as part of the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act. It was signed by the president on December 20th. It establishes Space Force as the sixth branch of the military. And the last time we saw something like that was in 1947 when they created the, the beloved United States Air Force. The legislation replaces uh, what now used to be the Air Force Space Command. Uh, the commanding general of that unit was beneath the uh, Air Force Chief of Staff. And it replaced the former Joint Functional Component Command um, that was under STRATCOM. And we'll talk about what those two things became as we move forward in the presentation. So the new commanding general of Space Force is called the Chief of Space Operations. He reports uh, not to an Air Force commander, but to the civilian secretary of the Air Force. And it's an arrangement that's um, pretty similar to the relationship between the Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, they both fall under the, they're separate and distinct um, military groups that are underneath uh, the, the Secretary of the Navy. And this is a really nice graphic that kind of makes those points. If you look under the Department of the Air Force, you see the Chief of Staff of the Air Force and the Chief of Space Operations are co-equal. They're heading up different branches of the military, and uh, they report to uh, the Secretary of the Air Force. Another thing I want to point out about this graphic is you look to the right, you look under the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I've highlighted there that now the, um, the head of the space operations has a seat at that table. One more change, you look at the bottom right, you see under the Unified Combatant Commands, an, 
I've highlighted the change there as well. You have the, the creation of the U.S. Space Command. It used to be under STRATCOM. Now it's its own combatant command. So here is um, this slide. I wanted to accentuate the fact that the, the two commanders, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Goldfein, and the Chief of Space Operations, uh, General Raymond, are separate and co-equal. One department, the Department of the Air Force, with two co-equal service and service chiefs. And that was established by the National Defense Authorization Act. So just a quick reminder um, for the cadets, what is the Joint Chiefs of Staff? Its function is to be the principal military advisor to the President, the National Security Council, Homeland Security Council, and Secretary of Defense. So the Space Force now has a seat at that table. And the benefit of that is being able to communicate you know, issues that are important in space directly with the president. So I made this graphic to kind of show um, a couple of things that have changed. The first being roles. That yellow bar down the middle is uh, the signing of the National Defense Authorization Act on December 20th last year. On the left side is where it used to be. On the right side is how things are now. So we had the commander of the Air Force Space Command was underneath the chief of staff of the Air Force. Now, the commander is the chief of space operations who reports directly to the secretary of the Air Force and has a seat uh, on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I wanted to show this uh, graphic here that shows, um, juggle the phone here. So this up here, this is all new. These are the unified combatant commands, and, and it used to be that the, the uh, space component of the Air Force um, was under uh, STRATCOM. Now you see it's its own combatant command, the United States Space Command. Here I hit the point again. Um, so the Air Force Space Command, with these changes, has become Space Force, and what used to be the the Joint Functional Component Command for Space was under U.S. Strategic Command, became the U.S. Space Command. That middle column there, you see the graphic where it was before under STRATCOM, and it's moved over to the right now as its own combatant command under the Unified Combatant Command. So some of the, uh, I picked out a few of the, what I think are the more interesting guiding principles uh, from the legislation. and. This one was very interesting that the Space Force must conduct day-to-day -day space operations in support of civil, commercial, and DOD users, but simultaneously protect U.S. space assets, deter aggression, and dominate in space should deterrence fail. I'm going to hit this one again later on in the presentation. Uh, that's one of the more interesting ones. It also said that it needs to be able to prepare for the transfer of appropriate Army, Navy, and other DOD elements. They're gradually going to be moved out of those respective um, uh, forces into the Space Force. And then they're gonna use existing physical locations. So they're not gonna be creating any new installations or bases. They'll use uh, what's already established. This slide is one of the most important slides and what I want you to take away from tonight's presentation if you don't get anything else. First, are Space Force and Space Command the same thing? Well, definitely not. You see that the Space Force's job is to organize, train, and equip, whereas the U.S. Space Command, under the Unified Command, is to conduct real-world operations in the space domain. They are two adjoining layers of the same defense apparatus. The headquarters of Space Force is in the Pentagon, just like the Army, the Navy, and the Marine Corps, and the Air Force. We have heard a lot of stuff in uh, the press about the U.S. Space Command. They're temporarily headquartered at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado, but they are looking for um, another place to headquarter the U.S. Space Command. But we keep, you know, if you weren't following too closely with this, it would be very easy to mix up Space Force and Space Command and think, well, they're looking to move the headquarters for Space Force. The Space Force is going to stay in the Pentagon. I've also seen some hubbub about, um, well, did uh, the Space Force borrow or steal the Star Trek logo? And I don't think so. 
Um, first, we've got the uh, Air Force Space Command logo. It's got that Delta symbol in it. That's dating back to the 80s. And going much further back, that NASA's uh, Meatball logo has that Delta shape in it. So, no, I think the the, uh, the Space Force's uh, logo design has some pretty good heritage going way back, well, before Star Trek. So what's being done now to build up the Space Force? Uh, I got to tell you, I've been working in and around government circles for uh, about two and a half decades now, and I've never seen anything in government move this fast. Um, it's probably some, some folks in leadership of the Space Force that wish it could go faster, but uh, as far as I can tell, it's moving at light speed. But what are some of the things that are being done? Well, we, we saw uh, recently how um, the latest, the 2020 graduating class of the Air Force Academy, 86 graduates are moving directly into uh, the U.S. Space Force. Air Force Secretary Barbara Barrett um, said something very interesting, and, and I don't think it's going too far to say that as our nation's first Space Force lieutenants, these leaders will join the ranks of, of uh, space power pioneers. They're building something that never existed before. And, and General Raymond said something similar to that. He said that the class of 2020 will go down in history as the very first class to commission officers directly into the U.S. Space Force. Starting May 1st, uh, the uh, thousands of U.S. Air Force members have gotten a, an email and uh, saying that they can apply to, to make the shift over to the Space Force. Active duty office, uh, Air Force officers and enlisted personnel in existing career fields and select other career fields are eligible, eligible to apply. But at the and this is a very important point here. At the end of this transition period we're in now that wraps up in 2022, assignments in space mission areas will no longer be available or option to the Air Force members. So they're serious. It's Everything is getting shifted over to Space Force. This is pretty big, too. Um, recent news that uh, the Air Force is transferring 23 units uh, to the Space Force. Um, Two of those that I have highlighted are, are local. So uh, all of those are going under under Space Force as well. And there, I'm sure there will be lots more to come, but that's just uh, the opening salvo, so to speak. This is interesting. It's, this is not a front burner uh, item, but there is definitely a plan um, to rename principal Air Force bases that house units, um, space units, uh, to be named space bases. Peterson Air Force Base is one of the examples uh, who may get their name changed. And other candidates are Schriever, Buckley, Patrick, and Vandenberg. So now that we have a Space Force, now what? Uh, I borrowed the next three slides from uh, General Thompson, the Vice Commander for Space Force, that he presented uh, recently at the Air Force Association Air Warfare Symposium in Orlando. Because, frankly, I think he says these or makes these points better than I could. And the first is um, one of the primary areas of responsibility for the Space Force is GPS. There is hardly an area of our lives that is not touched uh, by, by GPS, uh, from precision-guided munitions to um, our cell networks, and it just has its fingers in, in every part of our lives. And so... Um, the Space Force is tasked with protecting that resource. Another thing is space domain awareness. I can tell you this, is, this touches where I work. Um, uh, for a number of years, I've worked with our nation's weather satellites um, in navigation. I spent eight years as a navigator. And it's during that time that uh, we started to have uh, encroachments on our orbit boxes from uh, other space operators from other countries, and we had to sort of learn how to, um, to live in close proximity with those other satellites. And uh, between that and the space debris problem, uh, we need somebody who is cognizant of everything that's up there and can see well into the future, uh, the next several days or a week or more, uh, to let operators know that uh, they're going to be running into something or something's going to be running into them. Um, on more than one occasion, um, uh, we've had to move. Um, other spacecraft have had to move for us. Uh, so we've got um, an area called space domain awareness that they're keeping tabs on as well. 
there was a missile attack, the Al-Assad Air Force Base, um, which this kind of highlights uh, the early uh, missile warning um, responsibility that the Space Force has. And uh, thanks to the quick reflexes of Space Force people, um, today we are not talking about any uh, dead Americans at Al-Assad. Those people were very quick. And, and in, in his presentation, uh, General Thompson says that those birds were only in the air for six minutes. That gives you an idea of just how fast they were able to react. And kudos to them for that. So some of the stuff that they're deploying now uh, is like the uh, uh, Space Surveillance Telescope in Australia. It's designed to track and identify debris and satellites um, pretty high up, 22,000 miles. Uh, it began operation last month or rather in March, and it's operated jointly between the U.S. Space Force and the uh, Australian Air Force. So th they have a lot of uh, resources they're bringing to bear to do their jobs. Here we have the example of the very first offensive weapon. It's a space jammer called uh, the Counter Communications System uh, that was uh, stood up. And uh, so far, it's the only offensive uh, weapon in our, in our arsenal, but I'm sure that will change over time. This silent barker now is a, uh, a proposed program uh, to, it aims to improve satellite threat intelligence and space situational awareness. Well, what that really means is it's sort of a space-based reconnaissance system able to maneuver among satellites and then investigate their capabilities and their threat levels. Um, this type of satellite is called an inspector satellite, and it's analogous to, you know, the air intercepts that we're hearing about all the time in international airspace. You know, we see Alaskan uh, fighters that are dispatched to intercept Russian bombers and see what they're up to. Well, we have to have the same sort of capability in space and Silent Barker would, uh, would bring that capability to the U.S. And why? Well, we see the Russians have been uh, up to the same sort of thing. Uh, back in 2015, they launched a satellite called Cosmos 2504 that uh, soon after it got uh, into space, uh, detached from its booster and made 11 close approaches to that upper stage. <clears throat> and that behavior is consistent with what we would expect from on-orbit anti-satellite weapons. Then, just last November, uh, we saw uh, another one, the Cosmos 2542. It sort of detached a, a smaller satellite called Cosmos 2543 that uh, we think then began tailing one of our spacecraft, USA 245, the classified image uh, imaging satellite uh, operated by the National Reconnaissance Office. So our adversaries are militarizing space, and we had better be ready to respond. And, and uh, Space Force is taking steps to have that response in place. I had uh, one of the things I thought was kind of cool that um, the Air Force Research Lab is working on, a tool that would be put in the hands of Space Force operators um, unfortunately, the the video won't play. It's something called uh, Space Cockpit. It's just one. Uh, there are other examples, but one of the things that space operators don't have is some sort of uh, a system that gives them the big picture of what's going on in space. Um, current operators, and, and I can attest to that for working a number of years in the field, you know, we, you're looking at text screens. And they don't give you the big picture. And the space cockpit is a system, um, it's virtual reality, that gives you a picture of what's going on uh, in orbit. The, uh, the users will be able to see other assets, zoom in up to them, see w what they're getting close to, Just give operators the big picture of what's going on in space in a particular area of concern. So these kinds of tools are being developed for the Space Force. Now, at this point, I want to sort of change gears. Um, I talked about uh, the, the definite changes that have been made. Um, I want to sort of have a fun thought experiment and uh, try to look into the future and 
and, and take an educated guess of what we might find. So what follows is pure conjecture, but it's based on trends exhibited by the U.S. adversaries. We just talked about the inspector satellites. Um, there are uh, aggressive human spaceflight programs to go to the moon and Mars by our adversaries. We could also look at trends in the U.S. human spaceflight. We've got the Artemis program that's ramping up. Very large uh, U.S. Um, NASA-led uh, program to uh, to take us back to the moon and uh, keep us not just there, but uh, throughout cislunar space. And uh, that term is probably new to a lot of folks. Cislunar space, it just means that region of space that surrounds the Earth and extends out uh, to the moon and all of the orbits and the space in between. Um, so we have trends with there, with the ISS, all of the commercial entities that are popping up now. They're building their own vehicles, their own habitats, and other infrastructure that's to be added to cis lunar space. And Space Force, I think, I'm conjecturing, um, is going to be concerned with all of that, too. Um, then there's the question of, you know, many are asking, and it's a natural question to ask, if we'll see any sort of Space Force um, sending craft into space with carrying crews. Well, I don't think it's going to be in the near future, but um, necessity, as they say, is the mother of all inventions. Um, need will always drive our responses. And most importantly, we have to ask ourselves, what will our adversaries do? So we can extrapolate using these concerns uh, to take a look at what is available and what might be of interest to the military. Now, we look in, uh, throughout the past, uh, the military uh, has often taken commercially available um, aircraft and uh, changed them to suit a military role. I've only put two examples here. There are many more. But, for instance, there's the U.S. Navy P-8 uh, Poseidon anti-sub aircraft. It's just a, a, a derivative of the Boeing 737 commercial airliner. <clears throat> then there was the, uh, the United States Air Force KC-135 refueling aircraft. It was a variant of the Boeing 707. Examples of the military taking um, commercially available products and using them to fulfill a military role. Okay, so what is in the commercial sector today? I'm going to step through just a few of these. So... One of the more notable examples is Spaceship Two, which is built by the Spaceship Company that's partnered uh, with Virgin Galactic. Virgin Galactic is going to operate it to take up paying passengers. It's a scaled up version of Burt Rattan's Spaceship One that won the uh, X Prize back in 2004. It's built for flight up to 100 kilometers altitude. That's the suborbital regime. Um, it carries a crew of two and six paying passengers. Just this week, Virgin Galactic announced a Space Act agreement with NASA uh, to create propulsion and thermal protection systems for a point-to-point -point version of this spacecraft. So I know from my personal experience, I know some of the Virgin Galactic folks, and I, I've long suspected that they wanted to go to orbit. Um, it's to, to make it into orbit, uh, it would definitely take a big change, but this Space Act agreement uh, with NASA shows that they're casting an eye towards orbit. So it, they could make another version of this vehicle that could also be, uh, uh, could suit military roles possibly. Then there's also the Dream Chaser. It's built by Sierra Nevada Corporation. It's quarter size of the old uh, space shuttle orbiters. There's a cargo variant. There's a crewed variant uh, that carries up to seven crew members and it's built for flight to low Earth orbit. So could there possibly be a military role for either, either of these two spacecraft? And to answer that question, I look back to a study that was published in 2009 under the title of the Small Unit Space Transport and Insertion Program. It was a joint study between the Air Force and the Marine Corps. <clears throat> and they were looking at um, what it would take uh, to put a Marine Corps 13-man uh, rifle squad anywhere on the globe in two hours. And so they, they put specifications together that it needed to be able to carry life support for four hours. Uh, 
at an average of 220 pounds per man with 150 pounds of supplies per man times 13 men. It needed to, it needs to be able to deliver payload of 4,800 pounds, uh, plus life support systems. And they were looking for the solution to come from existing technology or a slight extension of it. So this shows that there is a published need by the military of to for manned space flight, or at least um, delivery of per- personnel to the ground via space. Other technology that's available, we've got uh, SpaceX is, is in the news now with uh, its crude dragon. Um, it's a wingless capsule design. It seats up to seven crew members. Uh, the mission is to the International Space Station. It is reusable, unlike the Apollo capsules uh, that were, you know, one flight and they were done. Uh, it lands like the Apollos with parachutes uh, at sea or on land. Uh, they have been landing uh, in the ocean, but uh, in the near future, the, the, the design does allow them to land like the Russians have been doing for decades on a land base. So we also have Boeing Starliner. Uh, it's built for flight to low Earth orbit uh, to service uh, the ISS. It's reusable as well. Boeing says up to 10 times. Also, seven passengers or a mix of crew and cargo. Um, it features, uh, <laughs> I thought this was pretty interesting. This is right off of the uh, Boeing's website. Uh, they made a point of saying that uh, the, the capsule has wireless internet and tablet technology for the crew interfaces. Then we have the Orion. It's built by Lockheed. The primary contractor is Lockheed for NASA to be operated by NASA. It's going to be launched on uh, SLS rocket, that behemoth rocket that uh, NASA is working on. It's built for flight to lunar orbit to support Artemis. And it, it can carry a crew of two to six people. And it's capable of traveling to the moon or Mars, although I, I think I would want some sort of other spacecraft attached to that. It's, um, I can't imagine flying three days or a few months in something that's really just a kind of a, a glorified phone booth. It's more than just vehicles that would be needed or want to need a place to go. It's one thing to get into space, but you need a destination as well. And a company, uh, one of the more notable ones, Bigelow Aerospace, has been at this for uh, quite a few years. Um, Back in the 80s, NASA had developed this uh, inflatable module design that they purchased because NASA felt like it it wasn't worth uh, um, developing. They were going uh, for the design of the current International Space Station, which is a, a rigid structure. So Bigelow bought that developed it. They've now flown two examples, the Genesis 1 that uh, flew in 2006 and it followed a year later by the Genesis 2. Both of those those uh, two stations are still on orbit and functioning well. And uh, in 2016, Bigelow flew up what they call the BEAM or the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module and connected it to the International Space Station. You see a picture of it to the uh, lower right there. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, to me, that kind of looks like a overblown jiffy pop but they also have designs for uh the b330 nautilus and also the x base deep space uh, habitat and uh, also a moon base uh, as the picture at the upper right depicts so they have the capability of offering um space spaces and planetary bases those are also um resources that could be made to fill a military role if the military expressed a desire for it so manned military flight, well, certainly the commercial sector is capable of delivering systems. I think in the next 10 years, the most likely role, uh, again, in my opinion, is going to be search and rescue. So I look back to the guiding principles that we saw uh, codified in law to, quote, support civil, commercial, and DOD users and protect U.S. space assets. Well, certainly um, people in space are going to be included with that. Uh, so think about the, the cadence that, that is building now in manned space flight. We've got regular flights to the International Space Station, uh, now facili- facilitated by new U.S. vehicles. We've got the Artemis program to the moon. And we've got other commercial ventures, including orbiting hotels, manufacturing facilities, and fueling stations. They're all going to pop up in support of those things that are currently flying and, and, and 
due to fly in the next two or three years. So a search and rescue apparatus would, um, if it was in place, would drastically drive down the cost of putting people in space. And then by doing that, enabling a much more rapid growth of the whole cislunar economy. So if you just consider the cost of the multiple layers of redundancy that are built into spacecraft today, and that, that graphic the, at the bottom right there, or over to the right, I, I took directly off of Lockheed's Orion website. And I highlight the triple redundancy. Anything that's going to carry humans has got to have a primary system, a backup, and a backup to the backup, and sometimes a backup to that. That adds incredible cost. Um, so the more expensive the vehicles are, um, the less likely that they're going to fly very often. So if there was a sort of PJs, of, like the Air Force Pararescue capability in space, the, the builders of these vehicles wouldn't have to build in so much redundancy. You have less expensive vehicles that would then spur the, uh, a big growth in the number of flights that we're, we're capable of, of carrying out. And who but the military could fulfill a search and rescue function? NASA? Not a chance. Uh, they're purely search, uh, research and development organization. And while the commercial sector could technically do it, I don't think it's likely because, at least for now, um, there's not a profit to be made. I mean, they, they, they can't exist without a profit. If they even decided to do it, they would probably go out of business attempting it, uh, in my humble opinion. So if the, the military was able to provide some sort of search and rescue capability, it would have a, a profound effect um, on space flight, human space flight. So in summary, um, let's hit the high points again. Space Force was signed into law in December of last year, so it's a real thing. Uh, the former Air Force Space Command became Space Force with a seat on the, uh, uh, the J JCS still under the Department of Air Force. That's another big point there. Um, there was some talk about making a Department of, of the Space Force that didn't ever materialize. So Space Force is still under the Department of the Air Force. And their job as a Space Force is to organize, train, and equip. The former uh, JFCC under STRATCOM became a separate combatant command called the U.S. Space Command. Their job is to conduct the real-world operations in the space domain. The transition phase, which we're currently in, is going to go through 2022. And the Air Force officers and enlisted folks uh, will be transferring over to Space Force. Army and Air Force space units are being transferred now. And the Space Force is going to be headquartered with the Pentagon with the other military branches. U.S. Space Command is temporarily headquartered at Peterson. But that, that's uh, going to change as well. And ultimately, all of the space shops, I'll call them Army, Navy, Air Force, space units are going to be transferred uh, to come under Space Force. So hopefully I've been able to clear up some of the confusion that was probably out there with all these space terms being thrown around and clarified exactly what the Space Force is and what it's going to be doing. Just this week, the uh, Space Force put out its um, recruiting video, which is very good. You should go look at it. Um, but the thing that their moniker pops out, it's, I think it's great. It says, maybe your purpose on this planet isn't on this planet. I find that inspiring. So at this point, we can entertain some questions. So I think the first question that we had that was, I think, not answered in the chat was, do we know if there is key terrain or locations in space? Is it a polar location or the moon or halfway to the moon? Our uh, commercial assets and, and military assets in Earth orbit, uh, those are going to be key key areas that the Space Force is going to need to look after. Low Earth orbit, all the way up to geosynchronous orbit at 26,000 miles. All of those orbits um, contain um, space assets that are key to the United States. And that's what I believe, Bill, you can correct me if I'm wrong, what the Space Force is going to be concerned with primarily. And then what is the official Space Force Auxiliary? Are we technically their auxiliary? I, 
Now that, I don't know. I'd have to defer to General Smith on that, but I have not heard any talk um, of, of there being an official relationship, although it seems obvious to me that there can and possibly should be one. Bill, have you heard anything like that? No, that's a great question. Um, and I was just thinking about that before this meeting. You know, what is, and somebody had written it down, uh, the Civil Space Patrol, which, yeah, it, it's not not too far from um, our current environment to develop that operational need. You know, just real quickly, just a couple of comments. A great brief, by the way, Lieutenant Douglas. That, it really does summarize all the activity that's been taking place. I had the opportunity to interview General Deanna Burt, the one star in charge of operations for the Space Force. And she is actively talking about sending folks to the moon to protect mining operations that will eventually take place. So no different than Lewis and Clark setting out from the east to the west to discover uncharted territory and then set up forts. She makes that analogy and draws it very well. And the same is going to be uh, true for, you know, cislunar uh, travel. And, you know, if you listen to Elon Musk, we're going to Mars. So it's only a matter of time before we need that protection for American assets as we, you know, go into that domain. So I believe this question might be for Colonel Wolf. Are there any volunteer research or internship like opportunities available post quarantine? You know, that's that's the biggest concern. I've got a, a buddy of mine, uh, another Space Force Association member. He's a professor at Emory Riddle Aeronautical University. And that's just one example of a program. They had they used to have a space program in the department, but it, it has since closed. Probably the timing is a little off. But that's not to say there's plenty of other uh, opportunities for education and research and internships, uh, especially with the large corporations, Lockheed Martin, Boeing. I know somebody had mentioned iSpace, which is a really cool visualization capability. And I'll, I'll stop there just for a moment. One of the biggest problems we have in space, and you hit on it already, uh, is the problem with visualization. Airplanes are great because you can see them. You can see them take off, you can see them fly in the sky, you typically know what altitude they're gonna be flying on, flying at, depending on the mission, and you know the ordinance that they're gonna have, or if they're refueling, or if they're a cargo, uh, what they're gonna be able to carry. I mean, all of that is known um, and understood, and it's great because jet noise is an awesome sound. I was stationed at Nellis for 11 years, and I loved hearing all the aircraft take off on a regular basis, both from the weapons school, the 422 Test and Evaluation Squadron, and of course the Thunderbirds. Uh, it was awesome to see on a regular basis. And it inspired folks, back to the point. Um, and while space lift is interesting, it really is just for that moment. Um, so the, the key point is how do you visualize not just the asset in space, but the capability that it provides. And, and that goes back to the key terrain question. We have to be able to prioritize not just the orbits that we need, but those assets in those respective orbits that give us the capability that allow us to carry out our joint all domain uh, mission set for the DOD. But yeah, plenty of opportunities for internships. And next question is, what is the relationship between the Space Force and the private industry like SpaceX? Yeah, it's interesting. When you go back to 1946 and the Air Force Association stood up in January of 46, a full, you know, little over a year and a half before the Air Force stood up. And so it's that, in that same vein that the Space Force Association has stood up to help foster the relationship between industry and advocate on behalf of the United States Space Force. And so right now it's kind of a, a struggle for the Space Force to engage directly with industry unless there's some contract obligation that they're trying to let for industry to support. Uh, so that, that's really the relationship is the contractual obligation that the company has to the Space Force to carry out the mission that they have signed up for. Now, what, what we provide at the SFA is the advocacy arm to talk about and quantify uh, 
the space superiority mission, just like the Air Force Association does for the Air Force. So the next question is, will you guys be using SpaceX Starship Super Heavy? And when you say you guys, uh, I, you mean the Space Force, and, and yes, absolutely. I'm sure the Space Force is going to be using, I think uh, uh, Will Roper came out and said that the, the DASD for acquisition came out and said, we want to have as many launch vehicles as we can, um, but we're limited by the existing budget. So until we quantify again the, the number of launch vehicles necessary and the types of launch vehicles necessary to carry the specific assets into their specific orbital regimes, uh, it's going to be tough to, um, to determine those operational needs. Next question is, how can Civil Air Patrol cadets get involved? Well, and I appreciate Lieutenant Douglas for having me on, and that's one of the ways you can is uh, the Space Force Association allows that voice for anybody who wants to get involved. And we're a relatively new organization, but the expectation is to set up a outreach program, a chapter program, so folks can be part of the conversation, which is exactly what the Air Force Association does for the Air Force. We're gonna be that voice for the civil community, the industry community, the military community, uh, so we can have a common voice and discussion uh, as a professional organization. And the next question is about if you know of any plans for Space Force to open an ROTC program, such as the Air Force ROTC program. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, and again, Lieutenant Douglas did a great job of this, describing the relationship between the Air Force and the Space Force. And right now, the current numbers for the Space Force eventually are going to get to about 16,000 in the next few years. And as a result, they're going to use, just like the Marine Corps does with the Navy, they're going to use a lot of the infrastructure that the Air Force has. For example, there's not going to be a Space Force Academy standing up. They're going to use the Air Force Academy to continue to create that expertise for the Air and, and for the Space Force. Uh, so same, same goes for the ROTC program. There is not a vision right now to stand up a separate ROTC program for space. Is there a senior enlisted advisor assigned to the Space Force? Yeah, in fact, a couple weeks ago, Chief Master Sergeant Toberman got sworn as sworn in as the second member of the Space Force after General Raymond. Uh, so now there is, in fact, he does have his uh, senior the the Chief Master Sergeant of the Space Force is uh, Chief Master Sergeant Toberman. Will NASA become part of the Space Force or vice versa? No, just like we've got the civil component, as Lieutenant Douglas pointed out, the same goes true for, for NASA. And he, he, he made that point very well in terms of who is going to protect or defend assets or personnel in space. And that's going to be a military component. Um, and, but we still need the civil component, which is NASA, designed for technology and research and scientific discovery. What is the relationship between the AFA and the Space Force Association? Great question. We're in discussions with the Air Force Association. I think there's a, an opportunity there for a great partnership. I think um, the Air Force Association has a, a very arduous job of taking care and making sure that the Air Force is taken care of and advocating for capabilities to support air superiority. And so the expectation is to potentially leverage the Space Force Association to help with the Space Force research and that advocacy. Why do we need a Space Force? Just, I'm sure the same question was asked back in 1946 uh, when we had uh, air power, which was extremely well demonstrated. And that's the big difference is the demonstration of capabilities is visual for the air domain. And it is an, an extremely difficult to visualize for the space domain. So for the same exact reasons why we need a Air Force, we need a Space Force, and that is to protect and defend. And then if, if um, and ultimately gain space superiority and space dominance in that domain. Will the Space Force ever do anything on Mars in the near future? I don't think that's the expectation in the near future, just because of the cis lunar exploration, as was uh, discussed. I think what's going to happen is industry, just like industry has influenced the military and military has influenced industry, I think the same thing is going to take place. 
as uh, SpaceX continues to evolve and Elon realizes his vision of getting to Mars, that is gonna drive the military protection of those as assets. In fact, in that same interview with General Burt, and that'll be going out by the way tomorrow in our, in our newsletter, that link to that video, uh, she discusses the comparison between the movie Ad Astra and the fact is it's more of a pirate base than it was any other type of protected base. And the requirement is gonna have, is going to be to have military protection on, on, uh, on Mars. So we had a question about what is a job list for the officers in the Space Force? And we've got a reply that said Space Operators 13S, Cyber Operator 17D, 17S, and Acquisition Career 6X. Do you have anything to add to that? No, the only thing I'd add is just like we have different MDS shredouts in the Air Force, we're going to have different MDS shredouts in the Space Force. GPS would be considered an MDS, Mission Design Series. And we're also going to have specific missions that support the space dominance. So we, you hit on a couple there, Lieutenant Douglas. You hit on the uh, space domain awareness, uh, extremely important. GPS would be considered the mission design series, just like you've got an F-15 or F-16. The other missions include orbital warfare, space electronic warfare, space acquisition and sustainment, and then, of course, space domain awareness. So those officer shreds that you just identified will go into those different mission areas and in fact they just rolled out the undergraduate space training uh, revised version that starts to develop the specific tracks and expertise for those that officer career path will space force have their own recruiter or will they just go through air force recruiters they are going to use air force recruiters but i suspect the recruiting mission will include uh, space space force personnel there was a question about will taxes go up to pay for the space force, <laughs> but <laughs> the reply that we have in the chat box is taxes will not go up for this specific force. No, the the Defense Authorization Act is uh, is probably going to be pretty much set, and and that's probably one of the reasons why it's been such a long discussion about setting up the space force is uh, the cost. And uh, what we're really going to find, I think, the more we go down again, the joint all domain aspect of this, you know, we've got uh, aircraft in every service uh, except the Space Force currently. Um, and we've got, you know, redundant capabilities that uh, exist across service lines. The, the intent is to determine how the capabilities from each service uh, can support the domain superiority mission of the other. And, and that's really going to be the, the follow on. I think uh, the incoming chief staff of the Air Force just identified how we need it. We need to redefine roles and responsibilities in the DOD. So he's calling for that when he moves from PACAF over to uh, take over the chief role. And that's uh, General C.Q. Brown. So I think as we define those roles and responsibilities, uh, that's what we're going to see is how can we utilize assets from other services to achieve domain supremacy, thereby cutting down on the uh, cost. Is there a listing of jobs that we could get from Space Force? Currently, no. In fact, that in that same interview, she, uh, General Burt talks about how they are really targeting Air Force personnel right now in this, in this initial window, uh, existing um, Air Force personnel. So May 1st through May 30th, the uh, Air Force Personnel Center is really just uh, requesting folks to apply to the Space Force and then uh, all of that will be boarded and then folks will be selected into the Space Force. I don't think there's going to be any uh, lack of interest to join the Space Force from existing Air Force personnel, um, but needless to say, there's not a list of jobs per se to join the Space Force. Now, that being said, there's plenty of jobs in industry to support this rising uh, space domain requ uh, superiority requirements. Will the Space Force target the rising issue of space junk orbiting our planet and harming our satellites? Absolutely. Industry is already thinking about that, just like uh, we've got that service that's provided from the civil sector. Uh, the same thing's going to hold true, I suspect, for the um, for industry to help with that mission set. Is there a Space Force OCS 
there are folks that are coming out of um, officer training school that will go into the Space Force and those deliberations are going on right now. I thought the USA signed a treaty for the non-militarizations of space. Is that treaty dead or was I just dreaming? No, the, the treaty's not dead, um, but that goes to uh, really, it really goes back to law of the sea where yes, of course, there's gonna be a time when there is no uh, defensive action that needs to take place, but at some point, uh, you have the right to defend a capability that's providing a, a national critical mission in support of your national um, objectives. And so the intent is not to get, you know, deploy Marines into orbit to stand by to be deployed to another location, uh, thereby militarizing space. The intent is how do we defend our critical uh, capabilities? Will there be space alliances? And by alliances, and General Raymond is, is very outspoken about the fact that we need to partner with our um, our partners around the globe. Uh, so absolutely, and was as Lieutenant Douglas mentioned, there's the uh, radar in Australia. We have space operations centers in Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, France, Australia, Japan, and so all of these all of these partners are going to be critical to provide capabilities to fill in the gaps that we can't cover down on from a U.S. Space Force perspective. How does Space Force compare to the current capabilities of the Russian and Chinese? Yeah, that's all open source. I think you can go out and take a look at that. Uh, there, Just like there was a space race, you know, Sputnik started this entire discussion uh, back in 57. And so, you know, you just look at the technology and you, you see what's happening. I think there's a a uh, big concern from Congress that says that we've slowed down on the space race, but I don't think that's the case. I think the United States still holds a, a dominant foothold on the space domain uh, based on current technology uh, and examples, uh, as evidenced by you know us bringing the um, astronaut launch back to American soil. Well, I think we're, we've gone through a lot of different questions and like to thank Colonel Wolf for being here with us tonight and second Lieutenant Douglas for his presentation.